So thanks everyone for joining us. We have one mining legend here with us right now and we'll be joined by Frank shortly. Uh, but for those that don't know, last week they both wrote an op-ed in the Globe and Mail highlighting some jarring facts, which is that Canadian pension funds actually have more invested in China than Canadian equities with almost zero investment in our mineral sector. So we're gonna be having an active conversation about this today. Mark Bunting, the host of Red Cloud Financial and myself will be moderating the space and we encourage you guys to come up in the audience to ask questions. I know I've already seen a few people request to come up. I think for the first half, we're going to be asking questions. And then for the back half, the space goes till 12. We'll open it up to the audience for some questions for Pierre and Frank. Uh, kick it off. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Margot. Uh, Pierre, thank you very much for joining us today. We, uh, we appreciate it. It's uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, Pierre, you've said that you've had conversations with Canadian pension funds and that their response is usually it's not our mandate uh, to invest in the Canadian mining sector necessarily. Our mandate is to maximize shareholder value. Right. And essentially, they seem to be saying it's not really our issue. It's not our problem. And you call that attitude soulless and revolting. So can you elaborate why you believe it is the obligation? Uh, yeah, th thank you for, uh, first of all, for having me. And uh, thank you for uh, putting this subject in, in front of us, uh, your uh, listener, because it is a, uh, a, a topic of absolute key, key importance to Canada right now. First of all, let me recap that the eighth largest Canadian public pension fund, the so-called Maple Eight, they by themselves represents a third of all Canadian savings. So you're talking here like over $4 trillion. It is, it's an enormous amount of money. And back in the 80s and the 90s, they were by law, these are all, by the way, uh, these pension funds are public employees of various governments that put their money into these pension funds. They're created by each of the province and the federal government. And uh, when they were created, there were no legislation as to how they were going to get governed. They were self-governed, if I would put it this way. And um, their you know, idea to maximize return, absolutely. I have no issue with that. And uh, so back then, they were investing 90% of the money in Canada. And over the years, uh, some of the pension fund managers came from Goldman Sachs in New York, and they got staffed with people that love to travel around the world, so much so that over a 20-year period, 75% of that money left Canada. And of the 25% that's left, over 50% is in government bonds and about 5% in real estate and infrastructure. And less than 3% of that money is in Canadian public equities. And just to give you a frame of reference, as you said, that is less than the amount of money that these funds have invested in China today, which is absolutely mind-boggling. And to give you a reference, the Australian superannuation funds, which are the equivalent with three and a half trillion dollars, they have 27% of their money invested in Australian public equities. So almost 10 times what we have here in Canada. And when you look at the performance of the mining sector in Australia, vis-a-vis -vis Canada in terms of public equity, you can see the difference. I mean, it's a, it's a glaring you know, uh, mismanagement um, to my view of, of the money uh, and the, the responsibility that these funds have to uh, invest in Canada. That money goes out of Canada to create jobs outside Canada to come and compete against Canadian. And it was Canadian money in the first place that got in these funds. It is complete mismanagement of the, these pension funds. And I think that it is you know, high time that the various levels of government think about you know, how to regulate these funds so that they provide benefits for all Canadian. And that is, you know, the, the crusade, if you can say, that, you know, I'm after. And then when you look at, if I, if I can, and then as soon as Frank is uh, on, on the line, 
Oh, I see he's there. Now, Frank can talk about the, the, the value added to uh, the, uh, the, the junior sector in particular, but I'll just finish that uh, the, the junior sector today, as we know, is starve of funds. And that's a multi, uh, there, there's a, a few reasons for that. One being the loss of all the large Canadian mining companies over the last 20 years, the loss of Alcan and Falkland Bridge and Miranda and Inco. I mean, Inco back in the 70s was the, had the number one research and development program on batteries in the world. That all that knowledge went out the door when we let Inco you know, be acquired by a Brazilian company. And Falconbridge had, you know, incredible research and development, and same with Noranda. And these companies also funded junior company because out of their budget, they always had, you know, a 10, 20% that was to do joint ventures with junior company, fund junior companies. All that money is gone. So it's not only the fact that the pension funds have no ability today to invest in the mining sector because there's nobody home. Like the lights are off. Like there's nobody there that knows anything about the Canadian market. Zero. And two, there's no large mining company. And how much money do they have for juniors? Very, very little. They're not in the same order of magnitude. And on top of that, we've lost some of the, the, the money that was in, in, in dedicated funds in Canada. And Frank can talk to that. So the, the, the problem for juniors is threefold. And I think, again, we have to address these issues uh, head on. And I'm delighted to be able to you know, talk to uh, the audience here and mobilize them as much as they can to talk to their uh, politicians in, in every province in Canada because these funds are across Canada. I mean, the British Columbia Investment Fund has 0.5% of their money in Canadian equity. It's shameful. It is absolutely shameful. So over to Frank. Sorry, folks. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes, we so can hear you loud and clear. I'm sorry. First of all, I apologize to everybody. I had to download Twitter on my phone. It was always on my iPad. And apparently, this conversation doesn't work on an iPad. <laughs> so uh, here I am. I'm sorry. I missed the uh, I just caught the tail end of what Pierre was saying, but I'm not sure what the question is. If you can ask me a question, I'll pick up from there. Frank, it's uh, Mark Bunting. Uh, great to have you. Uh, good, to, yeah. good to hear from you. Um, so uh, Pierre mentioned a lot of interesting factors in his, his opening uh, statement, such as uh, how the Australian government and the Australian investment community supports its uh, public sector and, and mining sector, um, and also about the hollowing out of uh, Canada's resource sector, which really goes back nearly 20 years now with uh, the majors getting taken out. So maybe you could... Um, pick up on that in terms of your overarching view on this issue with the lack of uh, investment from pension funds. But also, would you agree that, that this uh, lack of funding in the Canadian mining sector is a multi-pronged issue that's been years in the making? One could argue there's been a lack of government support, um, a lack of government vision. You've got the pension fund problem. There are fewer independent brokers, many of them, many of whom have been uh, snapped up by uh, big banks. So uh, could you tie that all together for us and, and, and flesh that out? Yeah, well, I think that uh, generally speaking, just over the last since probably, I would say since at least 2010-11, there's been a dearth of institutional investors in this country willing to invest in um, the resource industry. And uh, a lot of that has to do with some of it has to do with the fact that we went through a bit of a bear market after 2011. Um, but a lot of it has to do that simply institutions have disappeared, not just the pension funds. But someone gave me the stats the other day. In 2010, there were the mining funds in Canada dedicated just to mining investment, total assets under management of about $16 billion. Today, that's $2.8 billion. Okay. And then you take away the fact that the pension funds, and I'm sure Pierre uh, threw in the numbers there, is like less than 3% of pension fund assets under management are invested in Canadian equities. 
it sh as Pierre said, it's shameful. And, uh, and this is happening at probably the worst time for, for Canada, because you know, I, I should give you a bit of background to what's happening in the world. There is a scramble to secure critical minerals, and there's a, there's a reason for it. There is a huge deficit in all the battery minerals that are necessary for the energy transition to take place, to reach this whole net zero goal. And the deficits are huge. Like we're talking about needing four times the critical minerals that we use today by 2040, four times. And we all know it takes 10 to 20 years to find a deposit and put it into production. So <laughs> I don't know, and, and the best minds in this industry have no idea where those minerals are gonna come from. So then you add to that problem that the world is basic, basically deglobalizing and there are balkanization of supply chains happening everywhere. Every, every country and every region is looking inward to secure their critical minerals. And, um, and, and we in Canada sitting on probably the, one of the largest, most prolific mining districts in the world are doing nothing about this. Um, and, and if you take Africa as a case in point, um, and what's happened there is that over the last 20 years, there's only been one country that has thought ahead until very recently, and that was China. China has invested $1.3 trillion in 165 low and middle income countries, over 20,000 projects in infrastructure and all sorts of development for one purpose, to secure the resources it needs for its future. And it's been doing this for about 20 years. Most of the world has been asleep at the wheel on this until very recently. And now they're, everybody's waking up and you're seeing it everywhere in uh, government statements, in government action. I was just in Saudi Arabia last month uh, giving talks at, at the Riyadh Future Minerals Conference. And there were 80 ministers from around the world there uh, because Saudi Arabia has now decided to do somewhat what China has been doing. And that is to invest heavily in what they call the super region, which is Africa mostly, but it's also West Asia and the Middle East, to be able to achieve its vision 2030, which is somewhat similar to the China's Belt and Road Initiative. It's, it's a long-term vision using long-term planning, and it requires a serious amount of critical minerals. So what they've said is, we're gonna invest 15, this kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we're gonna invest $15 billion over the next five years to acquire minority stakes in projects or mining companies in order to get the offtake of the minerals. And there is a rumor that they're also working with the United States uh, to act on behalf of both Saudi Arabia and the US in a joint action plan to secure those minerals. And a lot of that effort is going towards Africa. Now, Africa is not Canada. Africa is riddled with conflicts these days. You've got everybody in there. You've got the Chinese, you've got the Wagner group, you have the French, you have the Americans, you have, and now Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Qatar and Turkey. They're all in there maneuvering, backing certain regimes and what have you in order to secure the resources that they need. And there's a lot of conflict that's come out of that. So it's not a very safe and secure place. And I could spend an hour just doing a whole run on what's happening in Africa. But here we are in Canada, the irony is that here we are in Canada and we have an incredibly mineral rich country. And we have one of the best stock markets in the world that addresses this 43% of the global mining companies are listed on the TSX. We have thousands of firms that specialize in financing and accounting and legal, environmental, uh, and mining expertise throughout the country, but we're starved for capital. We've been starved for capital for over 10 years now. And we've been starved because the institutions have disappeared, the, the pension funds have disappeared, and the senior mining companies that we used to have in this country, I'm sure Pierre addressed this already, they're gone uh, with the exception of one or two. And in the old days, you would be able to go to those for both capital and advice to, the juniors would be able to go there and they're, and it's the juniors that find this stuff. You know, traditionally it's always been the junior sector 
that discovers and develops new uh, mineral properties. Eventually, if they work out, they're taken over by the senior mining companies. Well, that's absent, it's gone. And we should be embarrassed as a, as a nation that we don't even, that our own pension funds don't even have, have almost zero exposure to this sector. Frank, you, you make some really interesting points, and I, I just wanted to ask you a question highlighting how important it is for pension funds to own shares, because I believe Australia, uh, I believe earlier this year, or last year, Brookfield Asset Management offered to buy an Australian energy company called Origin Energy, but Australian Super blocked the bid. Do you think we could have uh, saved tech from getting acquired by, from Glencore if more pension funds own shares? 100% and you know and uh and I'll tell you why you know what was really it was also almost what what I would refer to as tragic comic that the premier of British Columbia at the time of that takeover offer was complaining loudly that this was a terrible thing that we'd be losing our one of our jewel corporations in British Columbia and that you know this comes with the loss of maybe thousands of jobs that tech was responsible for directly or indirectly and you have the BCI, the British Columbia Pension Fund, with $233 billion under management. They didn't own a single tech share. It, and to me, that is just, you know, so you're complaining without a solution. You have a solution right in front of you. And that's just whining. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything if you don't really put your money where your mouth is. And this is what I think this country needs to do. Uh, the Australians did block that origin takeover, and because and they said they they were blocking it because they saw that com that company being important to secure a clean energy future, and they didn't want to let it go. And here we're in Canada, we we let our companies go. The 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 tragedy and the irony here is that uh, tech would have remained independent if it had not been for the Chinese investment in tech who actually blocked uh, the uh, original deal that would have essentially uh, made sure that uh, tech would remain a Canadian company. If that block had been owned by, you know, Canadian pension fund, tech would have remained a Canadian company and so would have the coal business. And, uh, you know, the, the, the coal, you have to understand that the coal, the metallurgical coal that tech is producing is a critical mineral. If uh, you want to produce the cleanest possible, lowest carbon steel in the world, and you need steel to build cities, to build windmills, to build all the infrastructure that you need for the future, uh, this is the number one asset in the world. And now, because of uh, the ownership of uh, the Chinese, uh, it's going to get sold to Glencore. And uh, again, all the research and development that goes on and all of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the funding, it's all going to go. Another one. And uh, so it is absolutely ironic uh, that uh, the politicians, you know, like they, they want to, they, they, they talk about it, but they have such a, they, the mining industry has been so much ignored over the last 40 years that they've given away everything. And now, you know, they realize that we need copper. Uh, and, you know, copper is life. It, we do not have our civilization without copper because copper is the metal that carries all the electricity that provides our transportation. It provides our communications. I mean, think about this. Without copper, uh, there is no building over four stories because you have no elevators. You have no... And then... You have no cars, you have no ships, you have no planes. You go back to the 18th century without copper. And if we want to go green, uh, we have to go today. We use 80% of the terminal energy that we use is carbon-based. And 20% is electricity. Well, over the next 20 years, we have to flip that around to 80% electricity and less than 20% carbon-based for, uh, for terminal energy. Well, you imagine the amount of copper required to, to get there. I mean, we need to more than double the current production, and we don't have those mines. But as Frank pointed out, Canada is the second largest land mass in the world. So where do you find copper mines? Where do you find nickel mines? Well, you find them on land. And we have an, the second largest land mass 
but we there's no money going into exploration and again i pointed out the junior companies are responsible for about 55% of all the fines in the world and the seniors 45%. But our seniors are gone. Like, you know, we the, the, the only one left is tech and their budget is fairly limited. All the others, they're gone. So who is going to find the stuff on Canadian land if we can't find the money? And that's the key question, I think, that we're trying to address today. contrast between uh, what, what appears to be the patriotism of the Australian government and pension funds and investment co uh, community in general versus the culture here in Canada. And what can we learn from the Australian uh, sector? Well, I think that one of the things we can learn is that there was, you know, the resource industry represents 16 percent of our GDP here in Canada. I saw a quote from the Australian minister that was in charge of the superannuation funds, uh, and he was being asked about the mining industry. He said, how can we, and he was talking about the, the, the equivalent of our pension fund services, how can we be absent from the sector that forms such a large part of our economy? Of course, we're going to continue to invest in mining. And, and this is, to me, this is, that's the intelligent way to look at this. And then we're, we're, taking a very self-defeating path here. So the just to add, the, the pension funds today in Canada, the way they're managed, they're very Americanized. And uh, their view is the Canadian stock market represents 3% of global equities. So we're going to put 3% of our money in the Canadian market, and they do it strictly with ETF. Okay, so it's th there's no management there. And there's nobody in you know, in the door. Like the, the lights are off. Like the, the 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 room is dark. There's nobody to talk to. They just index that you know two and a half percent, three percent, whatever they want. And they run out elsewhere. Well, that model would be would be good if all the other countries in the world would put three percent of the money in the Canadian market, the same as they do. But they don't. And the reality is that when you're a small country you have to invest in yourself before you can attract other capital. And we are missing out on this big, big time. And I, it, it, it's high time that it's being recognized in Ottawa and in all the provincial capital and redress. And uh, when I hear the pension fund managers say, well, our mandate is to maximize uh, the return, Absolutely. Well, I can show you dozens of portfolio managers that run tens of billions of dollars in Canada, Canadian money, Canadian equity that have performances that are better than any of these pension funds. So can it be done? Absolutely. The Australians show the way. They, are, they have returns that are comparable to all the other guys without having to go to Hong Kong and Beijing and Sydney, Australia and all the wonderful place instead of opening offices in Thunder Bay and Shibugamu, okay? Like, you know, which is what they should be doing. And putting patriotism aside, if you look at this current, the current markets, just look at it from a logic point of view. As I said earlier, we're going to need critical mineral supplies that we don't know where they're going to come from. We have no idea. It's just, it's going to take so long to find them. So what's the end result? the prices of these commodities are gonna go up and they're gonna go up dramatically over the next five, 10, 15 years. And so what I've been saying all along, you know, sure, you have to, you know, can, the Canadian pension funds have had more money invested in China than they've had in Canadian equities up until now. I think it's time to close the China trade. I mean, you gotta look at what's happening in China. I mean, it's, they're, 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 uh, their markets are plummeting, the real estate market is imploding. Uh, they got a serious demographic issue in, in, in that country in terms of a declining population. The boom years are over. I, I, think, I don't think China's going anywhere. It's going to continue to grow, and I think it eventually will be one of the large, be the largest economy in the world. But the boom years are over. That trade, to me, is done. The next trade where a lot of money is going to be made, and if the pension funds really looked at the situation, the reality of the situation, they would come to the realization that there's going to be a lot of money made out of investing in, in these metals that are going to be needed, like a lot. 
And so how often, like, are you talking to the pension funds? And do you know if there's any organizing, organized lobbying efforts ongoing within the mining sector to, to get more investments from pensions? Because China's happy to play the long game and it scoops up projects that may or may not pay off over 20 years. Uh, but just Canada doesn't seem to be open to that. Uh, to answer that question, Margot, the, the, uh, this wave that we're, you know, uh, creating is at the very beginning. And uh, we have uh, talked to the uh, British Columbia, uh, you know, the, the premier there, the finance minister. Uh, we've talked to uh, the Ontario finance minister as well. We've talked to uh, as well uh, the uh, people in uh, Ms. Freeland office and uh, Mr. Champagne's office. Uh, so we're trying to create some awareness of the issue. The pension funds are, uh, you know, blissfully ignoring the issue. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hear it. Uh, they've, uh, you know, the, their view is that we, we maximize shareholder return and like, you know, come hell or high water, that's what we're going to do and we don't need to do this. So they are not going to self-reform and uh, it has to come from the very top. The people who created these funds have to decide that, you know, what the governance of these funds should be uh, because I don't see any... Uh, uh, anyone every time that there's a response is that our view is to uh, our mandate is to maximize shareholder return and take a uh, you know a flying uh, hike okay so um it has to come from the politicians okay gentlemen just a reminder to our audience that we'll be uh, taking questions shortly probably one more question from us and uh if you have a question just uh request it and we'll we'll find you and we'll uh, we'll bring bring your audio on uh this is for pierre and or frank uh do you think that the federal government is on the, the wrong track or the right track in spending billions on foreign uh, automakers and battery makers uh, instead of putting those dollars more directly into the critical mineral supply chain well, I, I'll go first, and then uh, you know Frank can certainly add a lot more to to it. Uh, but uh, the, the answer to me is uh, you know a bit of both, in a sense that to to spend you know the the seven billion I can't remember the the total amount of money to bring uh, the uh, battery uh, from uh, Norway here. The problem with that is that all the research and development is still not in Norway and Sweden. The, all the uh, research and development is in Sweden. So we are not adding any value uh, to the, uh, the the plant. I mean, we, we yes, we're going to have workers and yes, we're going to use critical mineral. Uh, hopefully they will be produced in Canada. Uh, do we uh, don't know where the the the, the supply is going to come from at this point in time? But to pay strictly for the battery plant, I don't think that is exactly the right idea. I mean, the, the idea is that you would want to have the research and development in Canada. You want to have the IP, the intellectual properties in Canada, and you want to have the supply coming from Canada. That would be far more important to my mind uh, and as an add on. I mean, to have the plant is good, but, you, you know, the rest of it has to be a priority as well. Yeah. And, and listen, I think Canada has the opportunity to just pick the low-hanging fruit here. And the low-hanging fruit is that we're endowed with lots and lots of minerals. And if you look at it from a politician's point of view, if I were a politician, which I will never be, um, I, I would look at what is the easiest path for Canada to take to make a contribution and to also enrich the economy and create jobs. And I think that the resource sector can create a lot of jobs, so they would score a lot of points there. But again, it, to me, without the critical minerals, all the rest is academic, you know, because I really, and, and I think, you know, I've read so many reports coming from uh, all sorts of places about the level of deficit in critical minerals in the lithiums, cobalts, nickel, copper, um, graphites, you know, China has a stranglehold on 20 of the critical minerals in terms of accessing and processing them. And we need to develop that infrastructure here in Canada, but we need to find the minerals first. And there's a global race going on and, and it's it's getting, it's gonna get ugly, I think. I think it's, a, it's almost a resource war in the making. 
So Canada should just really focus on the low hanging fruit and look at that. And then I think it achieves a number of different objectives, including job creation and, 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 and help with the economy. Uh, and it's also securing our future. Thank you. I believe we have an audience member up here, David Stein, who's an investor and geologist. Please go ahead. And also, if any other audience members have questions, please hit that request button and we'll bring you on up. David, go ahead. Thanks, Margot. Um, yeah, I, I consider myself, a, you know, a small family office investor. I'm also the founder and CEO of a junior mining company, Kuya Silver. And um, uh, this has been great. Um, really appreciate, you know, Frank and Pierre uh, for getting on and, and sharing their thoughts on this. I think ever, you know, most of the people on this call are going to be very supportive of what you guys are saying. And I guess my question is, uh, in terms of next steps, is there anything, you know, we kind of members of the public of the investing public can do to kind of push this agenda forward? Because I do, you know, I, I think it's really, really important and we'd really like to see some action on this. Well, I think, first of all, every CEO of every junior mining company in this country should write a letter to their politicians. That's a great place to start. Um, and until enough people make enough noise, you know, politicians will take, always take the easiest path. <laughs> so unless you, you, you create, you know, urgency, and, and it has to come from all parts of Canada. And I think so, you know, we have like thousands of junior mining companies here. Everybody should be writing a letter. 100% agree with Frank, and uh, I will uh, say that uh, when um, uh, we met with uh, the uh, Ontario uh, finance minister, for example, uh, right as we were leaving, he said to us, he said, uh, uh, if you can get, uh, you know, a wave going, he said, we need support, we need public support to change these policies. So what you should be doing is writing to not only your uh, writing representative, but the finance minister of your province, and you should be writing to uh, the finance minister in Ottawa. And uh, if he get, if they get like, you know, two, 3,000, 5,000 letters, let me tell you, we are gonna get action. I can guarantee you that because they wanna feel the love. That's what politicians are all about. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry, just to, just to, I'll, I'll wrap up. Sorry. Um, so, uh, I'm taking notes, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll be writing those letters, but then I would suggest, you know, we get our board members too, as well. And just to get those numbers, cause I'm only one guy, but, um, but, but, uh, yeah, we'll think of ways to get more numbers out there and more letters right, written. And I, I, I think that could be a good first step. Thanks guys. It's called the power of one. And let me tell you, it really is the power of one. If, if every one of you does the uh, writing, it will be, it will create a wave. Thank you, David. I have uh, one question. I also have some other people coming up and we'll get to your questions as well. Uh, I, I pinned it at the top. Um, one of Frank Juster's tweets, Ottawa announced yesterday that they're planning to reduce the time to approve mining permits. And they're going to do this by better funding the regulatory agency to get rid of paperwork ba backlog. What are your thoughts on this? Will, will this help? Maybe uh, get more I investment? Said, as I said, as I said in my tweet, um, it's a great start, but that alone isn't going to cut it. You know, it's a great start. It's in, and you know, you should always encourage anything that shortens the regulatory paperwork that is necessary to all the hoops you need to jump through to get a mine into production these days. Um, so it's definitely welcomed. Um, but I think unless you address the capital needs side of this equation, it's all academic. We need investment. Yeah, but you, you need both. You also need a path to production. And uh, at the, currently, uh, lots of mining companies are not looking into Canada simply because the path to production is like 12, 15 years. And in some cases, you know, undecided. You just don't know when you're going to get your permit. And, uh, you know, you can go to Africa, you can go to South America where, you know, like there is a timeline and they respect it and they get it done. So uh, to, you know, uh, streamline the particularly the federal environmental approval and make it jointly with the province so that you only have one 
approval process and make, you know, timeline uh, definitive, like, you know, one year for this, two years for that, so that people know exactly where to go is imperative. But without money, without finding anything, it me it's meaningless. Thank you. We also have Sebastian DeCloet, um up here from Red Cloud. Sebastian, if you have a question, please go ahead. Hey there. Uh, thanks, uh, Frank and Pierre, for, for, for joining in this. Uh, we are very excited to be able to host you guys. Um, I just wanted to make a point. Um, on March 1st, actually, the Red Cloud's hosting our pre-PDAC. It's day two, and we have the Honorable Jim Baird, or John Baird, <clears throat> Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, for the former PC uh, Harper government. Uh, and he's going to be speaking on a lot of these topics. So I would uh, encourage anybody that's on the line here uh, to come. We're also going to make a petition available to everybody in the junior mining space that's there in the lead up to the PDAC in order to try to go and, and push this initiative uh, forward. Um, but I wanted to go and, and raise a question. I mean, obviously, last year, there was a lot of uh, hype around the uh, Liberal government suggesting they would offer subsidies for Volkswagen up to $13 billion. Um, obviously, if that money was spent uh, in our backyard, um, we may be able to go and open uh, our own plants rather than try to go and, and coax foreign companies to come into the country. Um, if you were to go in and spend your money uh, in the country right now, what would your, uh, your sort of top areas uh, be that you would be uh, deploying your own capital? Well, if it was, uh, you know, if it, I think Canada is, uh, as I pointed out, it's the second largest land mass in the world. So where do you go? Do you go Quebec? You go, uh, you know, like the Arctic, uh, which is like completely unexplored. Um, you know, northern Quebec, like where uh, the the uh, Falcon Bridge, which is today Glencore Nickel Mines are, uh, that entire belt is, you know, a totally underexplored. Uh, th there's so much uh, to be done in Canada. Uh, for 13 billion, I think you could create easily hundreds of billions of dollars of value for Canadian uh, instead of getting a plant and uh, you know you where the intellectual properties still reside in Germany and uh, where uh, you know I don't know where they're going to get the raw material from, but you know like we're limited here in Canada because we just don't have enough mines. So. To my mind, where do you put the money? You put it in uh, in exploration. I mean, that's that's your research and development. And because all our mining companies are gone, our senior, the uh, Canadian government's got to act as a senior company for the next ten years. We have another question here from uh, Trader Mike. It says, when will big money come into the space and specifically with Canada Nickel? I think that's kind of falls into another question where, um, you know, it hasn't been set on how much of what particular metal will go towards an EV, um, you know, whether it's nickel, cobalt, uh, copper, lithium. So um, I'll ask that question again. When will more money come into the sector, specifically Canada Nickel? Uh, when we show uh, some leadership. And, it, and I think, again, and someone said it, I didn't say it, but, you know, how can we expect foreign investors, large pools of capital of foreign investors to come invest in Canada when our own pension funds don't? OK, we need leadership. And I think uh, it's either that or the big money will come in when, uh, you know, the, the, the game is fully on and prices have gone through the roof. Uh, as typically happens in cycles, uh, we have an opportunity to create wealth today for investors because it's still early and um, you can still invest in this sector in a modest, in, in an inexpensive way. It's going to get a hell of a lot more expensive in five years time. OK, but we need to show some leadership. And I think the leadership, again, I'm going to say one last time, has got to come from the pension funds. Large, large pools of capital should invest in Canada. Agree 100%. Thank you. Uh, we have Ted Dixon on the stage, who I know is a regular for BNN Market Call. Uh, Ted, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, 
thanks very much, uh, Margo, for hosting the space, and uh, Frank and Pierre for taking the time and pushing this uh, issue. I just wanted to make uh, just a couple of points, follow up on what Frank said about, you know, the, where we're at with the public funds. I mean, CPP has, you know, 32% of its fund invested in private equity, and, you know, trying to find out where that is is very difficult. And, you know, that's a governance issue, right? I mean, that's an illiquid, illiquid investment. And that is really something our uh, politicians should be looking at. And, you know, they could have, I guess, got away with that, not addressing it uh, until some, you know, we have now some risks about even the liquidity needs of the Canada pension plan over the next few years. How, you know, how does that, uh, uh, how is that impacted with this private equity allocation? And I, why I'm bringing that up is because it gets back to the whole uh, CPP and other uh, funds kind of leaving the Canadian public market. So the issues that, that we're addressing here today, they actually extend beyond just the critical mineral sector, right? I mean, the whole resource sector. The, so there's, I think there's a lot of overlapping interests that we can get, uh, we can harness to sort of keep the ball moving that extend beyond the critical minerals area. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just the, the brokers and, and the oil and gas industry. I mean, they're facing some of the same challenges. So I think there is, uh, there is a potential to get some momentum here. And just on another point that uh, I think uh, Pierre made, like, yes, I mean, look, we wouldn't allow China to make a big investment in our critical minerals industry in Canada. OK, fine. So if they're not going to make the investment, who is? Well, we have to yeah. make it. And this has to be made by our politicians. So um, I guess the uh, so I just uh, would add. And, and maybe ask, like, how do we go from here to get the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party to focus on this as they put their campaign platforms together for the next election? They're doing it now. And this is the time that we really got to get them to focus on, you know, bringing money back into Canada, because if we don't do it, you know, who's going to do it? So, I mean, yeah, that's basically, I guess, I, the follow up on one of the earlier speakers, right? Uh -huh. let, yeah. yeah. So let, let me go first on this. OK, so again, and, and you brought something up that's very important and it's it's actually it's 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 tragic that on one hand, Canada saying we're not going to allow China to invest in critical minerals in this country but at the same time that our pension funds have more invested in China than in Canada. I mean, it, it, it just, it, it, it's just an oxymoron of situation there. That's number one. Um, when it comes to, and you brought up, the, the, your first question was about the private equity. And if you look at the makeup of the portfolios of these pension funds, it's all 60% long-term government bonds, which don't do anything to uh, you know, improve the economy. Um, and the, the, you know, like I said earlier, there's less than 3% in public equities. And a lot of it is in private equities. And the, and the thing about the private equities is that, you know, it's an opaque, opaque kind of sector that is really hard to value. You, you know, when you mark to market and the reason they went, as I understand that the reason that there was a shift from public equities to private equity is because there was increased demand from the regulators to do more frequent valuations of the portfolio. And so it's much easier to hide behind a private equity ownership, which is really difficult to value. The only way you get price discovery on those things is when you try and liquidate them, unlike, you know, unlike, you know a, a public equity, which you can, you can quote every day. So I think that that is a, a, a real deficiency in the way that these pension funds are set up. And that has to be addressed. And, and to answer your overall question, I think we need to shame our government into action. We need to shout very loudly and shame them by just showing them the facts. We, we've gone through in this conversation many facts which shouldn't be, they should not be. And, and yet they are because no one's doing anything about it. So I think we need to shame our politicians so that they can use moral suasion, if nothing else, to change the rules of these pension funds. So if I can add to that, uh, Charlie Munger, uh, Warren Buffett's partner, used to say, uh, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. And the incentive here for the pension fund, these pension fund managers to maximize uh, their 
you know, uh, what they get at year end, their bonus, is to have the, the smallest variation in the value of the portfolio. So they hate public equities because public equities go up and down. So what do they do? They go private equity because private equity is, you know, marked to perfection until you try to sell. As Frank pointed out, they're totally illiquid. And not only that, but, you know, none of these pension funds are currency hedge. Uh, so if, you know, by miracle, we get a government that, you know, finally does the right thing for Canada and the Canadian dollar starts to go up, all those, re all those returns that they're talking about disappear because of the currency, uh, because they're 75% invested outside Canada. So you can imagine the disaster that that could be. And yet, you know, they, there's no governance regarding that. A dollar invested by a Canadian pension fund into, you know, uh, the, the, the Shanghai, you know, uh, you know, like streaming bank is valued at the same level as if it was invested in the Canadian Royal Bank of Canada, the RBC Bank. I mean, does that make sense to you? Not at all. Okay, and it's the same for the investment that they have in Indonesia and Vietnam and everywhere else. It's valued at par when it shouldn't be valued at par. And that's, you know, something that has to be l looked at. Uh, the insurance company can't get away with that, yet the pension funds do. So there's a big mismatch of governance that has to be addressed, and the sooner the better. But more importantly, when you look at the difference between the behavior of the Canadian pension fund vis-a-vis -vis the Australian pension fund, it is totally shameful. And that, you know, the, the, the only way to address it is to talk to the politicians. Pierre and uh, Frank, we're going to wrap it up here with uh, one last question, which will give you a chance to summarize your thoughts. Um, there was a Global Mail story a while ago with the headline, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, Canada's critical minerals dream in peril. Uh, do you agree with that? Is it that dire or is that hyperbole? And also, second part of that is if you could summarize the critical factors needed to, in, in terms of how to get these pension funds to invest, sort of barging into their offices and slapping them around a bit, how do you get these pension funds to invest? Um, I think you well, may be muted there, Margo. Oh, was oh, I think you were muted. Did you guys hear? Did you guys hear Mark's question? Yeah, I did. I did, and I'm sure Frank did too. Um, I, you know, the uh, I, I agree 100. We are not gonna. We are not. Canada is not gonna do its fair share uh, in terms of uh, Canadians. If, uh, one, we don't get our politicians to uh, address the issue, uh, the governance issue of these uh, public pension funds, they are not going to self-redress. Uh, uh, they have no incentive to do it because the way their incentive for the management is currently is totally wrong. And the only way to do it is for the politicians to address it. So my uh, and and, and uh, Ted is absolutely right. It's not just I mean the uh, mineral industry, but it's also the oil and gas industry, and that applies to the entire entrepreneurial sector of Canada. I mean, back in 1982, uh, Canada had a GDP per capita that was 95 percent that of the U.S. Today, we're at 72 percent. You know, you imagine the loss of power that we've had over the last 40 years. Why? Well, because in part, all of the, these trillions of dollars that have left Canada is not invested in Canada. We've lost all this, these head offices and there's no leadership. And that is to be that has to be addressed at both the provincial and the federal level. And so, again, write to your politicians, make the wave, you know, like these waves in the stadium, like, you know, like that's what we've got to do here. <laughs> and the, the bigger the wave, I tell you, the bigger the politicians will respond and they will in due time. They will. Can I like, I'm going to make one last comment before we wrap up, because I think this will appeal to this audience. OK, what we need to convince it's it, 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 it's a pitch and it's going to have to be come from a a large audience of participants in our sector is this. And this is a fact. Juniors are the seedlings that will secure our future. 
Okay, that's where the mineral discoveries and the development of these discoveries will come from, as they always have. And we need to nurture those juniors. We need to nurture them because they're going, they're going to be the reason we're going to have a secure future in this very rapidly changing world. So um, I think we have to come together. It's a very big community. Most of, all, most of us all know each other. It's a, it's a very close community. I've been doing this for over 40 years. And I've realized that I, you know, the difference between our industry, our sector, and other sectors is we, we work together. We're a very closely knit industry. So we need to come together and convince our politicians that they need to force a change. Frank, Pierre, thank you so much for your time. If there's no other questions from the audience, we will be wrapping up. I want to encourage everyone to give Red Cloud a follow for co-hosting, as well as Frank Justra and Pierre Lassonde. And also, speaking of junior minors, uh, PDAC is coming up, and Red Cloud will be hosting a pre-PDAC 2024 mining showcase on February 29th to March 1st, which will be showcasing a bunch of junior miners speaking about their exploration projects and feasibility feasibility studies and a whole lot more. So if you're interested in that as a retail investor, make sure to go register on their website. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.